The apocalypse. How many have we seen now? Hundreds? Thousands? Tens of thousands? There's been so many, and for so many different reasons. Aliens, zombies, nuclear war, asteroids, AIs, simian flu. Of course, in reality, the world hasn't ended. At least, not yet. Humanity still perseveres, pushing onwards, starting wars, spreading diseases, and developing and promoting unregulated tech that could prove dangerous in the wrong hands. Huh. When I put it like that, I guess the real world isn't looking so hot either. So why then are we consuming more apocalyptic fiction than ever before? A subgenre of science fiction, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction often focuses on scenarios where civilization has collapsed or is about to. These scenarios range from climate disasters and worldwide plagues to alien invasions and singularity events. And while apocalyptic fiction is usually grounded in reality, or at least a variation of it, post-apocalyptic fiction frequently takes place in a primitive future where only scraps of the old world remain, focusing largely on the psyche of the survivors as they manage the devastating aftermath and cling to the remnants of their humanity. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word apocalypse is an Old English borrowing of the Latin word apocalypsis, which in turn is derived from the ancient Greek word, well, apocalypsis, meaning an uncovering, an unveiling, or a disclosure. First recorded in the rule of St. Benedict back in the Old English period, since the 1800s, the word apocalypse has become synonymous with the end of the world, the end of days, or more generally, a global disaster which causes immeasurable damage to human society. This sense most likely stems from Christianity, particularly from the Book of Revelation by Apostle St. John, a culturally significant prophecy which provides a somewhat optimistic vision of Judgment Day, revealing God's promise for redemption from suffering, describing the second coming of Christ and the victory of God over the forces of evil, an event which would result in the destruction of civilization, the end of days, and the beginning of a new order in which the righteous would prevail and suffering would be vindicated. In more recent times, apocalyptic events have been represented in an abundance of literary, film and gaming works, each portraying spectacular, albeit horrifying, imaginings of the end of the world. As you can tell from this, for as long as there's been humanity, there's always been stories about its inevitable destruction. In fact, ancient societies were well versed in producing pieces of apocalyptic literature, many of which speculated on the end of the world. Perhaps the earliest on record is the Epic of Gilgamesh, a Mesopotamian epic which predates the Bible and recounts the deeds of Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, a man seeking immortality following the death of his companion at the hands of the gods. Terrified of his own mortality, Gilgamesh embarks on a perilous quest to locate the immortal Utamishtim, a man Gilgamesh believes holds the secret to eternal life. Following a series of epic trials, Gilgamesh finally locates the legendary Utnapishtim, who, when asked how he obtained his immortality, explains that when the gods warned of the great flood that would soon descend upon them, Utnapishtim was instructed to build a ship so vast it could carry all of his family and all of the Earth's animals. When the violent storm arrived, it brought with it humanity's destruction, except for Utnapishtim, his relatives, and the animals. After setting the creatures free and offering a sacrifice to the gods, Utnapishtim and his wife were rewarded for their role in preserving humanity, and thus offered the never-to-be-repeated gift of eternal life, as well as a place among the gods. This account largely matches the flood story that concludes the Epic of Atrahasis, as well as the biblical story of Noah's Ark wherein Noah preserves the seed of man on the instruction of God, while society is destroyed by a great deluge. A similar narrative is also found in the Quran, though the Quranic account never establishes whether this was a global event or a localised one. In Norse mythology, Ragnarok is a time of great destruction, in which a series of catastrophic events take place, 
including the release of evil forces into the world and the burning of the Earth, all of which culminate with the eventual flooding of the entire world. And in the Hindu Dharma Sastra, according to the Matsya Purana, King Manu was informed by Vishnu of a destructive deluge which would be coming very soon, advising the king to build a vessel large enough to accommodate his family, all animals and nine types of seeds, so that a new world could be re-established once the waters had receded. As mentioned previously, the Book of Revelation is filled with prophecies of destruction, including St. John's explanation of the divine, in which he makes it his mission to reveal God's kingdom, promising justice will prevail and ensuring that all suffering will be vindicated. Revelation describes a new earth, with the intention of inspiring Christians and reassuring them that they will be chosen for salvation, thus inspiring optimism for the end times rather than fear. In 1805, Jean-Baptiste Cousin de Granville's sci-fi novel Le Denier Homme was written and published. Widely considered the first modern piece of speculative science fiction, the poem is set in the distant future, in a time where humans have lost the ability to conceive. It tells the story of Omegarus, son of the King of Europe and the last child to be born on the continent. Following a vision of Sideria, the last fertile woman on Earth, Omegarus vows to find her and embarks on a journey to Brazil where she resides. Once united, they encounter the spirit of Earth, Ormus, who urges the couple to continue the human race, and thus Omegarus returns to Europe with Sideria. In Europe, however, they meet Adam, the first man. He informs them that he has been condemned by God to watch over the damned as they enter hell, and as such, persuades Omegarus and Sideria not to prolong the life of humanity, as God has predetermined that all life should end. Having convinced the couple, Omegarus and Sideria part ways and later perish, much to the anguish of Ormus, who can't survive without humanity. Shortly after this, the graves of the dead begin to open and the rapture begins, initiating the events described in the Book of Revelation. Perhaps what was taught in Revelation is so deeply ingrained within our psyche, it's why we've come to view the end of days as entertaining or even comforting. Though, as we move forward, it'll start to become clear that there's more to our love of apocalyptic fiction than simply religious influence. In 1815, the eruption of Mount Tambora in what is now Indonesia emitted huge quantities of sulphur into the atmosphere, lowering global temperatures and altering weather patterns around the world. This volcanic winter is believed to have triggered 1816's Year Without Summer, a destructive event which resulted in agricultural turmoil and food shortages across most of the Northern Hemisphere. Largely inspired by this incident, Lord Byron's 1816 poem Darkness is one of the earliest English language pieces of apocalyptic fiction, telling of the end of the world and one man's survival through Ice Age conditions. The poem helped establish the theme of the last man, which later appeared in the works of several poets, as well as inspiring thousands of novelists, including the one and only Mary Shelley. Though widely criticised at the time of publication, Shelley's 1826 novel, The Last Man, is now generally recognised as one of the first pieces of post-apocalyptic fiction, following a group of survivors as they navigate a plague-infected world, with much focus placed on the story's protagonist, who must fight tooth and nail to protect his family, only to be left the last man alive. With the end of day's theme fully established in literature, in 1885, Richard Jeffries published what is perhaps the granddaddy of apocalyptic fiction, one which has acted as a template for many future iterations of the genre. After London documents life on Earth following a sudden and unspecified cataclysmic event, one which has plunged humanity into a desolate future ahead of its time in many ways, after London describes a wild England, a country dominated by nature and filled with advanced animals and degenerate humans. Exploring climate anxieties and fears concerning the Industrial Revolution, after London provides one of the earliest examples of not only catastrophic fiction, but the increasingly relevant eco-horror. As technology advanced and novels became plays, radio broadcasts and eventually movies, cinemas became the new home for apocalyptic narratives, with one of the earliest apocalyptic films being 1916's The End of the World, 
a Danish film depicting a series of natural disasters that occur when a stray comet passes too close to the Earth. However, it wouldn't be until after World War II that apocalyptic fiction would gain widespread popularity, most likely as the possibility of nuclear annihilation entered the public consciousness. In the centuries since, thousands of films have warned of the destruction of humanity, yet themes have changed largely depending on the political atmosphere at the time, giving each period its own unique style of apocalypse. For example, in the 1950s, political uncertainty was largely prevalent, with a spotlight placed primarily on the atomic bomb, Cold War tensions and the space race. As such, the decade introduced bleak and eye-opening apocalyptic cinema, bringing us films like The Day the Earth Stood Still in 1951 and 1959's On the Beach, a particularly depressing depiction of the aftermath of World War III and the subsequent annihilation of all life on Earth. By the 1960s, society had fallen into a new kind of chaos, particularly in the US. With the Vietnam conflict raging on and the Cuban Missile Crisis bringing the world one step closer to nuclear warfare, Hollywood movies of the period began taking inspiration from these real-world events. Perhaps one of the most widely recognised is 1964's dark comedy classic Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, which concerns a US Air Force general who orders a preemptive nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. The 70s brought with it biological warfare, political distrust again, overpopulation, paranoia, Thatcher, all themes that work their way into our media and explored in films like 1973's Soylent Green. Set in a fictionalised 2022, where overpopulation, global warming and pollution have led to severe worldwide shortages of food, water and housing, civilization is brought to the brink of collapse. With themes of paranoia and government cover-ups, this was the beginning of a new apocalypse, the subtle apocalypse, the one instigated by governments and those in positions of power. And it was totally, totally fictional. This paranoia and distrust of the government only increased during the 80s amidst Cold War fears and nuclear missile panic. As a result, cinema offered yet another new take on the apocalypse, this time introducing audiences to nuclear Armageddon and the devastating aftermath of nuclear war. 1983's The Day After follows the residents of Kansas as they struggle to survive following a nuclear strike. In a similar vein, 1984 brought threads to UK audiences, a grim portrayal of two ordinary families caught up in the aftermath of a nuclear strike, and offering an incredibly British and notably depressing exploration of the medical, economic, social and environmental consequences of such conflict. Two years later, the film adaptation of When the Wind Blows offered a heartbreakingly charming insight into the impact of nuclear war on an ordinary British couple. This time, the apocalypse was terrifying because it felt tangible. These weren't portrayals of fantastical times and aliens from out of space. These were stories of average people with average lives who just happened to be caught up amongst the warfare. The 90s, however, made the apocalypse sensational again, introducing a range of new tropes and re-establishing some of the old ones. We saw more aliens than ever before thanks to Independence Day, and asteroids seemed to become an ever-present threat thanks to 1998's Deep Impact and Armageddon. However, as the millennium approached, dystopia became entwined with the apocalyptic genre. 1997's The End of Evangelion offered a cerebral, psychological take on the apocalypse, one which followed on from the 1995 series Neon Genesis Evangelion and explored what might happen if a single organisation decided on our behalf that humanity was unfit to survive. 1999 saw the release of The Matrix, a dystopian thriller which describes a future where reality is simulated by sentient machines to pacify the human population while their body is used as an energy source. This iconic piece of cinema established the technological apocalypse, which only became more prevalent with the development of the internet, Y2K hysteria and the advancement of new technology. 
Today, our grim fascination with our own extinction seems to have shifted to tales of global warming, ecological catastrophe, and sentient artificial intelligence. As writers, filmmakers, and games developers continue creating a host of compelling stories which reflect our concerns and warn us of what might be to come. There's a lot of apocalyptic fiction out there, more than I can ever discuss in one video. But if the end of the world is so horrifying and tragic, what is it about these stories that keeps reeling us in, especially when we ourselves stand on the brink of destruction each and every day? In 2020, amid an unprecedented global lockdown, the 2011 blockbuster Contagion became one of the most popular movies on iTunes, Netflix, and Amazon Prime. In a film that eerily reflected the period, Contagion depicts the spread of a lethal virus originating from China, which then spreads across the US. Additionally, according to data released by Now TV, back in 2020, nearly a quarter of those asked admitted to watching films about disasters, the end of the world, and the apocalypse as a way of comforting themselves during lockdown. Of the 2,000 people who took part in the survey, it was revealed that fans of these movies felt more mentally and emotionally resilient compared to those who weren't interested in the genre. So what is it about this genre that keeps us fascinated? What is it about this media that draws us in? Is it the thrill of the unknown? The spectacle of watching our world fall apart? Or is it something else entirely? Well, in the case of Contagion, it could be argued that audiences had a strong desire to watch others survive this fictional pandemonium in hopes that the same situation will play out in the real world, with the film acting as a glimpse into the near future where a cure is found and humanity is saved. Perhaps it provided a safe space for audiences to experience the chaos without actually having to worry about it for a while. If we're focused on these fictionalised versions of events, it's no longer a matter of worrying about getting a grocery delivery slot, running out of toilet paper, or losing a loved one to this mysterious and deadly virus. Alternatively, it could be that people just wanted to view the experience from another perspective, perhaps from the perspective of a hero who's actually capable of doing something, as opposed to being trapped helplessly in the house drinking wine over Zoom. Generally, perhaps the biggest appeal of not just Contagion, but apocalyptic fiction overall, is that it gives audiences a practice run, helping us mentally and emotionally prepare, and allowing us a way of exploring the unknown from the safety of our home. In the same way that we rehearse some social interactions or win arguments with ourselves in the shower, when we consume apocalyptic fiction, we look for solutions for the hero, and we plan what we would do in those circumstances. Thus, apocalyptic fiction provides us with an opportunity to learn something that could be drawn on at a later date, offering us an opportunity to strategize our attempts at surviving. Matthias Klaassen, a psychologist at Aarhus University in Denmark, summed this thought up in an interview with The Guardian. If you've watched a lot of what we call prepper movies, you will have lived vicariously through massive social upheavals, states of martial law, and people responding in both pro-social and dangerously selfish ways to a sudden catastrophic event. Compared to somebody who's never simulated the end of the world, you'll be in a much better place because you have that vicarious experience. While this specific reason for enjoying apocalyptic media makes sense during that specific 2020 event, it doesn't take into account the genuine excitement that we sometimes feel when consuming apocalyptic fiction. That thrill we experience when we see the world as we know it transformed into something new. Nor does it explain the morbid curiosity we exhibit when witnessing what would become of humanity in the event of a disaster. So does that mean we want to be doomed? Does that mean we long for the world to end? Well, no. Not exactly, anyway. According to Sheila Winborn, an associate professor of religion at Northeastern University in Boston, apocalyptic stories are often a reflection of our shared cultural anxieties. The threats and fears illustrated in apocalyptic narratives are often an allegory of issues that exist in the real world, from racial injustice to poverty to political distrust, Nothing is ever really as simple as viruses, zombies, or aliens. Whether this is nuclear war movies stemming from Cold War fears, to games like Horizon Zero Dawn, which originates from our anxieties surrounding technology and the sin of hubris. No matter the media or the platform, apocalyptic stories are always there to capture and reflect our fears. 
As writers, we take inspiration from the things happening around us. I've had a speculative sci-fi draft in the drawer for around three years, and if you're a writer, you'll definitely be familiar with the drawer. Recently, I decided to read it back, only to realise it's very obvious that it was conceived during lockdown. Take this piece of dialogue, for example. Mate, in the nicest way possible, you're full of shit. NASA did not, and I cannot emphasise this enough, did not manufacture thunder and lightning to hide fucking space battles. Connor scoffed, slamming his pint on the table in front of him. Er, uh, definitely can, and they definitely have. So I expect a full apology, but it turns out that I'm right. Did you smoke yourself stupid when we were lads like? Daniel chuckled. A bit harsh lad, well did it. And yet I'm inclined to think you, uh, you don't believe that NASA's covering up space battles. And um, I don't think 5G causes plagues. As you've just heard, what we write and therefore what we consume is generally always going to be a reflection on what we know and what is happening around us. Take zombies, for example. A supernatural phenomenon that has been an integral part of African, Haitian, European and North American folklore for centuries. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, goddess Ishtar makes an ominous threat to her father regarding the undead. If you don't give me the bullet of heaven, I shall strike. I shall set my face towards the infernal regions, and I shall raise up the dead, and they will eat the living. I shall make the dead outnumber the living. Though explored by H.P. Lovecraft, Ambrose Bierce, and even Mary Shelley in the 18th and 19th centuries, as Cold War fears ramped up following the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima during World War II, for a time, nuclear war became a collective concern, and thus the idea of getting sick from radiation and turned into some kind of ghoul was a fear that seeped into our media, only to be fully established as the decaying, flesh-eating corpses we know today, thanks to George A. Romero's 1968 classic Night of the Living Dead, in which it's implied the undead are a product of radiation emitted from a fallen satellite. The shift from Cold War anxiety to genetic mutation was the next step for zombie lore, as 28 Days Later created a zombie apocalypse brought on by genetic modification, and much like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, mankind's attempt at playing God. Released during a global financial crisis, which led to a worldwide recession, 2007's adaptation of I Am Legend pitches an obvious take on consumerism. Referencing plenty of familiar apocalyptic tropes such as the last man, a desolate city, and the decaying remains of civilization, protagonist Neville is given unlimited access to food, petrol, medicine, and clothing without a need for money, letting him live a semi-normal life despite the carnage surrounding him, which some have suggested implies life without people is somewhat manageable as long as you have stuff. More recently, World War Z looks at the zombie apocalypse as a viral outbreak, dealing with not only the fear of illness, but also exploring how systems break down in the face of a global catastrophe. 2013's The Last of Us depicts the horrifying aftermath of a mutant cordyceps outbreak, one which decimates society and transforms its hosts into aggressive zombie-like creatures. As you can see, the stories we're told and the worries these creatures represent are largely reflective of the fears that are prevalent in society at that point in time. In the current zeitgeist, robots and AIs are dominating our apocalyptic fiction, most likely deriving from our collective fear that sentient machines will turn on the human race and destroy us all. And while this is understood as a contemporary fear, it's worth noting that this concern isn't particularly new. According to Matt Novak of Slate, there's been anxiety surrounding machines since the 1930s, during which time there was mass concern that new technology would take our jobs and thus destroy humanity. This could be where our fears come from, this deeply ingrained worry that if machines take our jobs, then the long-established capitalist system, which has theoretically offered stability for centuries, will be eradicated, meaning life on Earth would have to change. This change can be scary, particularly for the wealthy and those who benefit from this system. So perhaps our fear doesn't come from a fiery apocalypse or robots killing us all, but simply a fear of change, of a new path, of a new future of humankind. Or perhaps it's not that deep. It said we fear what we don't understand. And perhaps this is the case with machines. Most of us can't comprehend the idea of a sentient machine. 
nor do we really understand the inner workings of them. Therefore, we fear them because we can't predict how they will evolve, living in fear of them because we consider them more advanced than us. Either way, apocalyptic fiction often carries with it a powerful message about humanity, giving us much to consider about societal, psychological and moral quandaries. Cormac McCarthy's The Road asks us how far we'd go to protect our loved ones. Horizon Zero Dawn has us questioning whether billionaire businessmen can be trusted. The answer is obviously no. And The Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse left me wondering if I actually had a sense of humour. But to go back to my original question, do we consume this media because we want to be doomed? I think as media consumers, we want to see what might happen when society is threatened and when humanity crumbles, because sometimes we need to see our fears actualized in order to understand them. To counter my previous point regarding a fear of change in humanity, it could be that the opposite is true. Perhaps apocalyptic fiction plays into a deep desire to be liberated from our current world order and instead taken back to a simpler time. For millennia, humanity's main motivation for living wasn't to buy the latest iPhone or to save for a car. For our ancestors, the drive to do anything was to simply survive. Though developed countries should, now, at least in theory, offer a comfortable living experience where individuals no longer need to worry about death from starvation or the common cold, our genetic makeup still holds on to the memory of our hunter-gatherer societies, when we would defend our settlements from wild animals and when survival was our primary concern. Maybe then, our interest in post-apocalyptic fiction simply reminds us of our evolutionary roots, offering a throwback to the often ruthless, primitive time when the meaning of existence was to simply survive. In some ways, a post-apocalyptic world is the dream. It's a world where supermarket shelves are fully stocked and there's no lines at the checkouts. There's access to cars and appliances without competition, and there's no longer a lengthy commute or even a need for money or work, all topped off with a very black and white world that's separated into good guys and bad. And therein lies the primary appeal of post-apocalyptic fiction. Audiences are allowed to indulge in a fantasy world that will most likely never exist. Modern life is a whirlwind of worries, all bound together by a constant need to compare our lives to others. Our apocalyptic fantasies capture something we secretly long for, a chance to start again, to simplify the planet, to escape our debts and our responsibilities and our general dissatisfaction with life. There's an element of freedom that might come with the end of days. In an apocalyptic world, suddenly everyday problems become insignificant. Your mortgage doesn't matter when an asteroid just landed on your house, and your kids' grades aren't relevant when all their teachers are zombies. In an apocalyptic world, contemporary concerns about mundane problems are replaced with more immediate concerns like accessing food and staying alive. The apocalypse is the grand reset, an equaliser, one that lets us start from scratch, allowing for the possibility of life on our own terms, where we can put our skills to use and set our own agendas in ways that modern society just doesn't allow. Consider for a second the banana bread era of 2020, when most of the world was in lockdown and many turned to baking, sewing, art and other simple hobbies to pass the time. This period, where many were no longer working nor had to worry about their usual concerns, gave some individuals a sense of freedom. For a brief moment, they lived a simple life where the commute, the weekly shop and the school run were far behind them. Though some look back at these early days of lockdown with a twisted sense of nostalgia, of course the reality is that being trapped inside our homes for months on end wasn't freeing, nor was it beneficial for us mentally or physically. While some were innocently baking bread and sharing TikToks, others were suffering. They were losing family members, losing their jobs, falling into deep depression. This wasn't a return to simple living for some, but instead the beginning of a nightmare. Because that's the thing. Surviving in an apocalyptic world would be like drawing straws. If you were lucky, you'd survive, and maybe you'd get a few extra years. But while apocalyptic imagery often promises a return to a traditional way of living, it would bring with it traditional ideology, such as misogyny, racism, homophobia, and many other negative attitudes that would pit survivors against each other rather than bringing them together. 
In the same way war movies glorify the heinous reality of war, or slasher movies present murder as sort of funny sometimes, apocalyptic fiction sanitizes and glamorizes a hellish situation. Cormac McCarthy's The Road is one of my favourite pieces of apocalyptic fiction, but that's because it shows us exactly how ugly humanity can become when faced with extinction, when the wind blows focuses on the mundane, on the endless waiting for things to get better even though they never do. The Walking Dead also does an incredible job of portraying the politics that exists within surviving tribes, showing us just how low people will go in order to remain top dog. As addressed, a powerful apocalyptic story makes us question our morality. These stories tell us a lot about ourselves, including what we want and what we fear. War of the Worlds is viewed by many as a commentary on British imperialism, and Devilman Crybaby is an anti-war story focusing on misinformation, humanity's paranoia, and our willingness to turn on each other when things go awry. They leave us asking, if that were us, would we survive? And more importantly, would we do it with our humanity intact? And if the toilet paper shortage of 2020 is anything to go by, I'm not so sure. What connects each of the stories I've discussed is that they each tell the tale of an ordinary person or an ordinary group of people, just trying their best to hold on to their humanity against unbeatable odds. The apocalypse gives writers a chance to tell the stories of average people, not police officers trying to solve a crime or superheroes fighting villains, just ordinary people who are just like us for real, who have to face the unimaginable and attempt to rebuild despite losing it all. We imagine ourselves in these stories, forced out of our comfort zones and placed into a heroic position where we need to build new bonds to survive. So perhaps our love for the apocalypse isn't about the end, nor is it even about being the last one standing, but rather about building connections and building a community that's stable enough to usher in a new era. Because that's the thing about the apocalypse. The world never ends. Not really. Billions die and humanity as we know it is changed forever, but there's always hope be it a handful of survivors, a cure, a clone of a scientist from the old world. There's always something. There's always a reason that the world keeps spinning because, well, life, uh, finds a way. And that's sort of what's happening now, isn't it? Perhaps we're going through an apocalypse without even realizing it, which in itself is ironic when we consider just what the word apocalypse actually means. Because slowly, humanity is changing. It's developing into something we haven't seen before. I mean, Christ, have you seen it out there? We face a different global crisis every single week. Extreme weather, war, social unrest, economic downturn, disease, new forms of AI, and we're documenting it all in our 24-hour news cycles, relentlessly sharing it on social media. The world ending isn't a hypothetical. The world has been, is, and always will be ending. And yet, for whatever reason, we continue on. In Snowpiercer, the Earth is uninhabitable, yet technology sustains life. Panic in Year Zero uses its final seconds to confirm that there must be no end, only a new beginning. And even The Road, a particularly bleak and cruel depiction of the end of humanity, indicates that life goes on. Humans are resilient and stubborn and sometimes so incredibly stupid because we choose to keep going even when it all seems hopeless. Apocalyptic narratives give us inspiration, showing us there's light at the end of the tunnel. Because if we feel like there's some kind of solution to the overwhelming crisis our protagonists face, suddenly the issues that we face in the real world don't seem so bad. Suddenly it seems like things will get better for us too. Apocalyptic fiction gives our lives some kind of purpose. Because if there's no light at the end of the tunnel, what's the point in anything? Of course, the ability to enjoy this type of content is a privilege. Right now, there are real children being killed in their homes. There are real people laying down their lives for the greed of wealthy politicians who couldn't care less about the sacrifices of the proletariat. There are real people being displaced because of climate change, because of conflict, because they cannot exist how they would like to without fear of being killed for it. There is real talk of nuclear war. For a lot of people, the end times aren't a fantasy or a piece of fiction that can be consumed and enjoyed and dissected by pretentious academics like me. 
For a lot of people, the end of days is fiery and brutal, and it is a reality. People are experiencing real world despair. So while we feel some kind of relief in knowing that our lives aren't as hard as those in the movies, or perhaps a sense of empathy, grief and loss for fictional characters, it's worth remembering that there are real people out there who need our compassion. Real people telling their stories. Real heroes facing their own apocalypse. People who are just trying to survive. Desperately clamouring for that sliver of light at the end of the tunnel. Apocalyptic fiction offers a fascinating insight into what exactly it means to be human, showing us a side of ourselves that we rarely get to bear witness to, showing us functioning at a fundamental level. In consuming apocalyptic fiction, we can ask ourselves how would we cope without a government? What happens when we remove laws? Do we revert back to our more primitive state? Or do we learn from our mistakes and rebuild a stronger society? Perhaps we'll never really know the answer to any of these questions. Perhaps warnings will be heeded and the future of humanity will be a glorious utopia. But I just got a news alert. And things aren't looking good.